Hey guys, it's Greg with Apple Explained, and today we're going to explore the history of the iPod Classic. This topic was the second place winner of last week's voting poll, and if you didn't get to vote, make sure you're subscribed. That way the voting polls will show up right in your activity feed, and you can let me know which video you'd like to see next. So the beginning of the iPod Classic line actually dates back to the original iPod released in 2001. Now at this time, Apple was still enjoying the success of their iMac and was looking to follow it up with another hit product, and they put their money on the iPod, a device that was miles ahead of any other music player on the market. And that's part of the reason why Apple decided to release a portable music player. They saw a huge gap in the industry and recognized it was ripe for disruption. Now I should mention that the first generation iPod wasn't actually called the iPod Classic. It wasn't until the last generation when Apple finally gave the iPod line the classic suffix. Now there are a total of six generations of iPod Classic, including several special edition models. And despite the design and functionality differences of every generation, they all had one thing in common a 1.8 inch hard drive that was incredibly thin and compact. And it was this component that allowed for the first iPod model to be created, because up to that point, there hadn't been a high capacity hard drive small enough to fit inside a pocketable device. So the original iPod's hard drive had a capacity of 5 gigabytes or about 1,000 songs. And we're going to find out how the iPod went from 1,000 songs in your pocket in 2001 to 32,000 songs in your pocket by 2007. The first iPod was available for sale on November 10th, 2001, and people were eager to get their hands on the new technology. It could be purchased for $399, which is $564 in today's money, so it was definitely a premium device, but many people were willing to pay for its premium features. It held 1,000 songs, which was really impressive at the time, featured a 2-inch monochrome LCD display, and a 5GB hard drive. But the most revolutionary feature of the iPod was the scroll wheel. It made scrubbing through your music library quick and effortless. And surrounding the wheel were four function buttons. Menu, skip forward, skip backward, and play pause. And I should mention that the first generation iPod was the only one with a mechanical scroll wheel. That meant the wheel would actually spin around as you moved it. Now its battery was estimated to last about 10 hours, but this was debated since some users experienced much less. Now the first generation iPod was a successful product and generated quite a bit of revenue for Apple, but it became clear that 5GB wasn't enough storage space, as users' music appetites outgrew their devices. So in March 2002, Apple introduced a 10GB model, priced at $499. Now this model also featured V-Card compatibility, meaning it could display contact information for contacts synced from a Mac computer. And just three months later, on July 17, 2002, Apple introduced the second generation iPod. And although its design was almost identical, it did feature a few small improvements over its predecessor. It allowed for better port accessibility and replaced the mechanical scroll wheel with a new touch-sensitive wheel. This model was available in 10GB for $399, but it also came in 20GB priced at $499. And in order to make the iPod line more affordable, Apple decided to continue to sell its first generation iPod, but lowered its price to $299. Now I should mention that the second generation iPod was the first to feature special edition models. Users could engrave No Doubt's band logo or the signature of Madonna, Tony Hawk, or Beck on the back of their iPod, but it did cost an extra $50. Now it wasn't until April 29th, 2003 that Apple returned to the stage with the new and completely redesigned third generation iPod. This device was significantly thinner than the previous models and it replaced the ordinary Firewire port with a proprietary 30 pin dock connector that drew a lot of attention. Placement of the buttons was also changed, being placed in a line beneath the screen rather than around the touch wheel. The third generation iPod also featured a sleek design with slightly rounded edges that made it more comfortable and satisfying to hold. And as for the storage, there were three options available, 10GB for $299, 15GB for $399, and 30GB for $499. Unlike prior generations, all models of the third generation iPod were compatible with both Windows and Mac although Windows users still had to reformat the device before use. 
and this generation actually experienced a drop in battery life from 10 hours to 8 hours. This was because Apple used a lithium ion battery instead of lithium polymer to reduce the iPod's cost. The following year in 2004, Apple released the fourth generation iPod as well as two other special edition devices. The first special edition was called the iPod Plus HP, announced on January 8, 2004, and it was a collaboration between Apple and HP, and the device featured an HP logo on the back and was fully distributed through HP only, making it an official HP product. In fact, Apple wasn't authorized to service the device since it had to be taken to an authorized HP service center for repairs to be made. Later in July 2004, the fourth generation iPod was released. It was thinner than its predecessor and one of the biggest features was the click wheel, which replaced the touch wheel. Now the click wheel was originally included in the iPod mini, but Apple decided to use it for the fourth generation iPod as well. But that wasn't the only technology Apple borrowed from the iPod mini. The fourth generation iPod also used its energy efficient components, which extended battery life to 12 hours, even though the device was equipped with the same lithium ion battery as the previous third generation model. And Apple made this fourth generation model more affordable for consumers, selling a 20 gigabyte version for only $299 and a 40 gigabyte version for $399. Another special edition iPod was released on October 26, 2004, but this time featuring its own unique design. It was a U2 edition of the iPod, which came out at the same time as U2's album How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb, and featured a red and black color scheme that matched the album art. Now U2 fans went crazy over this product, even though it sold for a $50 premium over the standard iPod, and part of its success was probably because of its bundled content, which was a $50 discount for the purchase of U2's entire back catalog, as well as 30 minutes of exclusive video content available on the iTunes store. Now around the same time as the U2 iPod, Apple released another model, the iPod Photo, which was considered to be an advanced premium version of the fourth generation device. As such, the iPod Photo featured an LCD display that could show a total of 65,536 colors and supported graphic file formats including JPEG, BMP, GIF, TIFF, and PNG. Users could connect their iPod photo to a television and play slideshows using the included TV cable. This model was available in a 40GB version for $499 and a 60GB version for $599, which was more expensive than any other iPod model up to that point. Now the iPod photo was definitely a welcome improvement to the iPod line, but it didn't mark a new generation. That didn't happen until October 12, 2005 when the 5th generation iPod was announced. But before we get into that, I want to mention a special Harry Potter edition of the 4th generation iPod that was released just one month before. It went on sale at about the same time as the Harry Potter audiobooks became available on iTunes. The Harry Potter special edition iPod featured the Hogwarts logo on the back and included all six Harry Potter audiobooks. Now we can talk about the fifth generation iPod that was released just one month later. It featured a 2.5 inch display and a smaller click wheel. This was also the first iPod capable of playing videos, and the first standard iPod to be available in two colors, black and white. The fifth generation iPod also marked the second time Apple fully redesigned the product. It featured a completely flat front plate and was much thinner than any of its predecessors. It could play TV shows, movies, podcasts, or music videos in MP4 and H.264 formats. It also came with an S cable that allowed it to play videos and slideshows on other displays. Now the 30GB version of this iPod was $299, while the 60GB model sold for $399. Now, on September 12, 2006, Apple updated this model but didn't consider it a new generation, so many users informally referred to the new model as the 5.5 generation. It featured a brighter display, longer video playback time, a new search feature, and better quality earphones. But this updated model actually lacked something, and that was the iTunes installation disk, since users were now able to download iTunes through Apple's website. There was also a change made to the iPod storage space since the 60GB model was upgraded to 80GB, all while lowering the iPod's price by $50 for each model. And finally, on September 5, 2007, Apple introduced the sixth and final generation of the iPod and added the classic suffix to its name. 
The iPod Classic featured a thinner design and outstanding battery life of up to 36 hours of music and 6 hours of video. The model kept the previous generation's 2.5 inch backlit display, but it featured a completely different user interface. The biggest change was definitely the front plate, which was now made of anodized aluminum rather than plastic. And because of this material change, its signature white color was replaced by silver. Now this model was available in an 80GB version for $249, as well as a 160GB version for $349. So you can really see the improvement in the price per memory ratio compared to the early generations of the iPod. However, on September 9th, 2008, Apple discontinued both of these versions and replaced them with an even thinner 128GB model that sold for only $249. This updated version also introduced some new features, including Genie and audio recording. So the iPod Classic was officially discontinued on September 9, 2014, likely because of low sales and waning consumer interest in the product. But Apple claimed the iPod Classic was discontinued because some of its components were no longer being manufactured. But I think it's clear that, considering how most people listen to music today, the iPod Classic no longer served much of a purpose. It had no wireless capabilities at a time when streaming became the status quo, and it still used the click wheel interface, which felt pretty outdated after getting used to modern touchscreens. And on top of that, very few people are interested in carrying an iPod with them in addition to their iPhone. But despite all of that, Something interesting happened after the iPod Classic was discontinued. Its resale price skyrocketed. During its peak, the 160GB iPod Classic was going for around $500, almost double its previous retail price. So I would be mistaken if I said there wasn't demand for high capacity iPods, but I think that demand is falling as higher capacity iPhones are released and streaming becomes even more popular. So that is the history of the iPod Classic, and if you want to vote for the next video topic, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.